Tonight we have Chris Prosperi. Chris and I, <laughs> Chris is the chef owner of Metro Beast, which out of, are you all aware of the Zagat survey? Okay. Out of a, a possible 30, he is usually around 27. I'm not sure anybody is higher in Connecticut. His food is absolutely wonderful. We have been friends, as I said, for a very long time. His ex-wife, with whom I am also good friends with, wrote a book called Wife of the Chef. About how wonderful I am. About how what It did say nice things. She always, and actually they still work together, so they're still very good friends. Um, here's the good thing about having a chef who's a friend. When I get in trouble in the kitchen, I make a phone call. And, and it's say, free. Chris. <laughs> I am in the weeds. What do I do now? For a while, Chris, who writes a column with Linda Juca, who will be here next week, um, they, they do something about kitchen, cooking in a kitchen. So he doesn't need me anymore because now he knows how to cook in a kitchen too. But today we're going to talk about anything you want to talk to. Um, Chris has brought a salad today. Um, which is delicious. All of his food is delicious. I made the brownies, and I had a little problem with the brownies today. <laughs> um, so what you see there is half of the brownies that should have come out. The other one, and I do make a lot of mistakes. That's why I have Jeff, and Chris is going to talk to you today. So first, did everyone get a little sample of the salad I made? So I had a really busy day. And I got back to the restaurant at four o'clock. So I had to make a salad really quick. Probably a lot like everybody when you get home, right? And you gotta feed someone or you're hungry and you gotta do it really quick. So I raided the refrigerator. My staff, by the way, was very cranky when I got back. Usually I steal things from them. Nobody would let me steal from them. They were like guarding their food as I came through. So anyway, I found some cooked potatoes. Uh, fresh asparagus is coming in like by the bushel now. I don't know if it's just a really good year or, I mean, I'm, al I'm almost sick of it, but not because it's so good. I don't even cook it, I just chop it and eat it. Anyway, um, and then some peppers and it, so I just threw it together. So I had this bowl of fresh vegetables and, and potatoes and stuff. And I was like, oh, I need a dressing. So I went, and I I went to grab the blender or, and then I was like, no, I don't have time for that. And then I went to grab a bowl and a whisk and I'm I'm like, no, I don't have time for that. And then I thought, oh, this is Lee's. This is something Lee does. So this is the salad dressing I grabbed. It's been on our menu for I'm gonna say 17 or 18 years now, and it it's called. And it's funny because I was telling Lee, we still call it Latitude because it's from a restaurant called Latitude 45. Latitude 38. 38. Latitude 38. In Maryland. <laughs> um, I was cruising on a sailboat with my husband and another yeah. couple. And when you're sail sailing on a cruise on a sailboat, you don't have a car, obviously. Yeah. So when it's time to go out for dinner, it can't be any further than where you can walk. And most of the restaurants are terrible because you just <laughs> they've got captive audiences. They're yeah. just not wonderful. Yeah. So we went to this restaurant called Latitude 38, <laughs> and the food was just awful. I I cannot tell you, but the dressing was outrageous so after we were done and the waitress said how was everything and I said oh you know everything was just wonderful and could I have the dressing for for the salad and she gave it to me yeah. and I have been making it and I've put it in my columns before yeah. it, is, it is it is such a and it, it makes like half a gallon yeah or whatever so it is. yeah and so get the recipe from Lee because I'm telling you it changed our lives and this is 18 years ago, and it is by far. And, and the funniest part is the way she tells the story. She, so she, she calls me up and she says, oh, we just got back from vacation. Let me tell you, we had one of the most awful meals in our life. The food we couldn't even eat, but, you know, we had nowhere else to go, and it was just barely edible. But I got the salad dressing recipe. You sh I want to give it to you. And I'm thinking to myself, 
wait, you just told me it was at a horrible restaurant. Why do you want to give me the salad? She's like, no, no, no. It was the only thing edible, and it wasn't just edible. It is it like the honest. best salad dressing I've ever had. And we've tested people, and we've tested even like top chefs to guess what's in it, and no one can guess what's in it. But it's the simplest recipe on Tell earth. Them. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, rice wine vinegar, a little white wine vinegar, garlic, a little bit of sugar, um, and then you put the mustard, and then you put that in the blender, and then it's equal parts uh, olive oil no and salt. regular oil. No salt. No pepper. No pepper. No, just, just garlic, a little bit of sugar, uh, and actually email a lot of sugar. Yeah, good amount of sugar. But I'm telling you, we when she gave it to us, she's like, just put it on your mescaline mix. You know the baby green mix. It is so amazing that it highlights every flavor of every different green you have in your mix. So and yeah, it's anybody a winner. who doesn't have the recipe. You can email me at Lee A. Yeah. White at AOL.com and I will give you the salad dressing. Yeah. It's just wonderful. And, and remember, don't forget, it's called Latitude. <laughs> you can use the recipe, yeah. but we have to keep, because the restaurant's probably not there anymore. Because those places, I not, no, no, they're they, not there they, anymore. They, you know, and it's not because it was bad, but those places on the, sh on, right, right on, on the docks and stuff, they rotate in and out. Mm -hmm. And that was 17 or 18 years ago. It was ago. a long time ago. So, so what did you think? Did you like the salad, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's great on everything. We do it on beans, we do it on Anything. lettuce, yeah. So, so that's our oh, salad. Oh, and first. it'll stay in the refrigerator for at least four to six weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is and, why she gives you such you a good. And if you do product. it in a blender, you don't have to stir it up again. Yeah. It 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 holds it? together, emulsifies. Yes, it does. Well, it, it kind of holds it together. Yeah, it's pretty yes. amazing. So anyway, that's my story about the salad. And if you hadn't, if you haven't had one, grab one because. And and if you don't have the recipe, get the recipe because it's it really was life changing for us. And the funniest part about it, like I said, is that we still call it Latitude, and now we're 18 years later, and I have new people starting, and they're like, that's a great dressing. Does anyone know why it's called Latitude? <laughs> and we have to tell the Lee White story. <laughs> now, here's, here's something more interesting that happened. About 10, 12, 14 years ago, uh -huh. we went to a food a, a symposium in where is it? West Virginia. Oh my gosh. West Virginia. If Lee ever calls you up and says, hey, do you want to go to West Virginia? Say no. <laughs> well, it wasn't him. It, it said, was where we went. No, where we went was gorgeous. The from the uh, town from the state line to where we went was was we flew. We rented yeah, a we Lincoln. Rent, no, we rented. We? Yeah, we wanted. To, we were like, should we fly? No, Lee's like, we're gonna rent a Cadillac or a Lincoln, like one of those boats, and we drove. <laughs> so we drove the three of us, Courtney, me, and Lee, drive from Connecticut to White Sulphur Springs. White Sulphur. It's it's a famous place. Yeah, I can't the Greenbrier. Remember the, Has the anyone Green ever Briar. heard of the Greenbrier? The Greenbrier. Yeah, the Greenbrier. And and after two days of eating three meals at the Greenbrier which I was really excited in the beginning. After that, it was like, oh my God, where's the McDonald's? Yeah. There is no McDonald's. <laughs> There's nothing there. You are there. there. There is nothing there. There's it's, nothing there. Right, has anyone ever been there? No, but you've heard of it, right? So I, I, know, I know nothing about this place. It's called the Greenbrier. It's supposedly famous. So we get there and there's like this brochure as you, we check in and I'm looking and I'm like, Lee, Lee, and she goes, yeah, yeah, I know. It's the bunker, it's the fallout shelter for Congress. And the it, president. And the president. And no one knew, it was a secret until the late 90s? Um, I think about that time. Now I don't know where the yeah. bunker is. I, you know, everybody knew that that was the bunker yeah. at so the time. The yeah. Washington Post broke the story, I think. In and the, then they yeah. had to go find a and new And they had bunker. to go find a new one. But the funniest part of that story, and this is about the, this tells you about the town Lee brought me to. <laughs> this town, um, so they Oh, knew, it was dry too. Yeah, it was dry, it no was alcohol. Dry. No so, alcohol. So we get, so the story is, is that they, uh, they decided they were going to put this bunker there, and I think in the 50s, 40s oh, or 50s. Oh, all of that yeah, time, a long yeah. time ago. And the t of course, who do you hire to do it? You hire the people in the town to do it. So they're digging this bunker, and the thing's huge. When you think about it, it doesn't. It houses them, um, their families, um, the office. Everything is there, yeah. all underground. So think about the construction, right? So the whole town gets involved and digs it. So here we are. The whole town knows what it is, and yet the entire country knows nothing about it. 
They send, so they, the FBI heard that there was a leak and that the Washington Post was gonna maybe do a story, but could they find out? So they sent undercover FBI agents to White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, to see, didn't tell them, just said go there, see if you hear anything about anything. So they go in as touristy, kind of like lost off the highway or whatever, so they start hanging out in the town, and uh, by day three, they had to change their security level, right, to top, top secret, because everyone in this town knew about it, but we didn't know about it because supposedly people don't leave this town and no one goes to this town. They don't. So for 40 years, no one knew this place was there. No, and it worked out really well. It worked out really well. So here's so. what happened. So we're in this Lincoln Continental or whatever it was, driving down. By the way, you're a terrible driver. I'm a terrible I'm driver. I'm a terrible driver. <laughs> but it, Courtney and I did most of the driving. So we're down there. It, we're on our way. We're almost there. And Courtney, who was, is a, she's not as quiet as she used to be, but she was a very quiet person. And she said, you know, one of the nights that we're at the food symposium, people are going to be asked if they want to talk about a book or article that they're writing about. And I said, yeah, they do it every year. And she said, I have a couple chapters. I said, you, you have a couple chapters? In her spare time, yeah. what does she sleep, four, four hours? Yeah. The rest of the time she runs the restaurant. Yeah. She does everything except for yeah. She wrote that book, yeah. and it, it, the thing happened on a Sunday evening, yeah. by su Saturday night, by Sunday morning, yeah. the buzz was amazing. Yeah, how many, how many agents did she have? She had four agents fighting for her and five publishing houses in New York already fighting, and they, had the, they weren't even at, the funniest part is they weren't at the thing. They weren't at, <laughs> yeah, that's why, but this, they weren't even at the reading. No, it was but just, they heard yeah, about it. Yeah, but everyone was talking about it. Yeah, and, and it's a great book. If yeah, you have not yeah, read it, it's, it's probably available. Here at the library. It probably is at the <laughs> you library. You can probably check it out. Anyway. That's right. Wife of the sh wife yeah. of the chef. This was the chef, and he is the first one to tell you that what he does at the restaurant is cook. Yeah, that's what I do. And everybody thinks I do every, for some reason, because chefs are so high and mighty now on television and all that, they think. The, the, the thought is that we do everything, and no, I, I mean, I cook, I run the kitchen. I mean, it's not an easy job, but without a good front of the house person and back office, a restaurant doesn't survive. So there's a team of people, I'm just lucky enough to have a partner that does the back of the house and the front of the house. I mean, she and does the, the office. And the firing and yeah. the hiring oh, yeah. and I the mean, manual. That's the 90% of why a restaurant succeeds, right? The food is just a small part of it. And, and the book, um, how, it was how many years ago? Well, it was basically 20 years ago. How old were you then? I was, th I was the young guy in the kitchen. That's how long it was. I know, it was a long so, yeah. time. So I was and, 30. And, and Courtney, I think, was, was 24, 26, 25, 25 when she yeah. wrote the book. Yeah. But she talked about how you had a hard time sleeping at night because everything hurt. Yeah, it's And tough you were job. young. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's why, I mean, I'm the oldest guy in the kitchen now, right? And I'm not that old, um, but I, it's a young person sport. I mean, now, and it's funny because I, I was telling my chef who's, who actually my chef, who's been with me for 12 years now, one of our new cooks, they were talking in the corner, two of them, they were talking in the corner and Brian just had a birthday. Oh, did he? Yeah, he just had a birthday. Years. Yeah, yeah. So he's 40 now. Mm -hmm. And they just found that out. And the two of them were sitting there, and as I walked by, I overheard, I didn't know he was that old. <laughs> I'm like, 40? <laughs> so yeah, it's a young, I mean, but the, so Brian, I'm the oldest, Brian's the second oldest, and everyone else, I mean, we're, it's funny because we make movie references, band references. <laughs> I mean, they were born, we were talking about it yesterday, when were they born? In the 90s. Some, some of them are probably, yeah, some of the kids right? would be in the 2000s. Oh yeah, the front, like the food runners, because we're on two floors, so we, the food runners is basically, um, you know, sports guys, sports people from the high school. I mean, yeah, they were born oh, 16 them, years ago. Tell them about the original restaurant and where you are now. 
Oh yeah, so the original restaurant. If how, how many? Uh, where's uh, where's uh, Madison? Madison? Madison. That's not far, right? No, it Madison. isn't that far. So no. there's a restaurant in Madison called. Uh, uh, Which one? Barbouche. 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 And the manager is a gentleman named Claude. Oh, yes. Okay, so Claude is who I bought Metro Beast from. Claude named Metro Beast because if you ever see Claude, you can ask him the story. His family actually refurbished the Paris Metro in the 70s. So they owned a construction company in Paris. Claude is from Paris. And... Um, when he came over here, he always had this dream about opening a restaurant and stuff. He had his family ship over all the memorabilia from the old Paris Metro, which is why he called his first restaurant Metro Kitchen. And we have the sliding, you know, the, I mean, and back then the, the, the subway doors were wooden. I mean, I don't remember. My dad says we were on it when we were like, I mean, I must have been two or three. But he remembers like me trying to fiddle with the latch because you opened them by hand back then. <laughs> which wasn't very safe. So anyway, so he brought all this stuff over and opened a place called Metro Kitchen in Granby. And then it was doing so well, they wanted to do a second place. So they opened Metro Beast. Everyone, uh, 20 years now, people are asking me, and we don't even care how you pronounce Beast anymore because is it Bis? Is it B? Is it Bis? What is it? How do you pronounce it? It's and what does it mean? We always just say, listen, it's just short for Bistro, don't worry about it. But what it is, is if you're in France and you go to a show and um, we say encore, right, at the concert, they say bis. Bis is encore in French. This was his second restaurant, so his encore to Metro Kitchen. And that's where Metro Bis came from 25 years ago. And then he was at the end, didn't want to do it anymore. Um, his partner was getting a divorce, so they sold it to us, and yeah, and that was in 1998. And we've kept we kept the name because we just loved the concept that it was like this. It was the shape of a rail of a subway car. You know, it's a small. It was a small narrow room, and we had the, the metro doors in the place, and the lights from the station, and the seats from. And when we took it over, and we still have some of these in storage, the seats instead of chairs, they were actually the wood and leather padded benches from the Paris Metro. We took. Wow. I mean, Claude. Uh, I Claude, didn't even know Oh that. yeah, Claude used them, but you know, after like for a two-minute subway ride or a five-minute subway ride, it's okay. But then you start doing this. Yeah. You know, you can't. An hour dinner, you couldn't. You could tolerate it because it was just a. It was totally wood with just this little leather pad on the back and the leather pad, leather pad on the seat. So they were they were good subway seats, but not good. Uh, not good restaurant seats, so we took those out. But we loved the idea, and we had the opportunity to move five years ago, and when we moved, it was like almost destiny to come into this gorgeous <laughs> building. It's called the 1820 House, and um, the main dining room is this small, narrow room that looks like a subway car. And again, it fit perfectly, so we just took all of our stuff and put it in there. Yeah. And it, it, I think that you closed the other restaurant on a Friday of Labor Day weekend. Yeah. And, and we you opened, opened on Thursday, the following week. Yeah. No, we op we actually closed on Sunday. We had a wedding. We had a wedding you on Sunday. Right away. Yeah, we had a wedding on Sunday at the old place and a rehear and a, some kind of rehearsal or function on Thursday at the new place. So we had from Sunday to Thursday to move and open. Mm-hmm. And we did, but I mean, it's, it sounds like it's crazy, but it was what, a not even a quarter mile? Well, you know, it's interesting. An eighth of a mile down the street? About 30 years ago, um, my husband and I were in Los Angeles, and I was writing for the Norwich Bulletin at the time, and I thought to myself, I, I'm going to see if I can have an interview with Wolfgang Puck. So I called his office. Yeah, yeah. They said, sure. And, and I went there, and I interviewed him, and that's, that's another story. But when I got in there, and it was probably about one in the afternoon, there were drop cloths everywhere. They were painting things. They were doing this. And I said, oh, you're closed this week. And he said, no, we'll be open tonight. Wow. Yeah. Restaurants do that. We don't close. No. We no. Just, yeah. No, when we, same thing. If we have to paint, we're closed on Sundays anyway. So we'll, we'll start painting Saturday night when the last customer leaves. We'll get there early on Sunday morning and like get it going, and then usually by eight o'clock we're putting the tables and chairs back in place, and then the next morning we open again. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it's a nonstop. It's. Uh, I was telling someone we have a new guy who's uh, 
he's I think he's only 19 or 18 and he's uh, he was a high school student with us he was one of the kids like I said that ran the food up and down the stairs um, and then he went off to college some Ivy League school somewhere I can't remember which one but he didn't make it something ha bad happened or whatever and then he came back so he's taking classes at University of Hartford but he doesn't know what to do and he's you know he's enjoying his time in the kitchen with us but we try to make sure they understand that it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. And that's where people either do it like me forever or think they can do it and do it for a couple of years and end up hating it because you can't have it as a job, right? Because a job is something you go to for a few hours a day and then you go home. The, uh, the restaurant business is a style of life. I mean, the, the Library of Congress in the I want to say the early 90s deemed us a subculture in the United States, hospitality workers. So we're actually in our own category. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Like, you guys go out to dinner on Saturday. I go out to dinner on Monday. <laughs> you go to the dinners on Friday night. I go to the, I mean, you go to the movies Friday night. I go to the movies on Tuesday. <laughs> you know, it's a totally thing. You bank in the, in the morning. I bank like running in there like as it's closing. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's a whole everything we do is on off hours. I go to the grocery to the stop and shops open till eleven, thank goodness, because I go to the grocery store to buy like toilet paper and stuff at like nine thirty at night. <laughs> Tell us about what a kitchen looks like on a Saturday night. Your your place yeah, on a Saturday. We call it we night. call it controlled chaos. It's funny because if you've ever had a time where you feel like time stands still that's our night our perfect night like we have uh, so right now we have a hundred seat banquet facility and then we have um, 70 seats in the restaurant and then we have another party room that seats 12 and a porch that seats 35 so right now is our busiest time because um, the porch is open, so that gives us an extra 35 people. We're in wedding season, so the downstairs, our, our banquet facility is always packed, either a rehearsal dinner or a wedding or a shower or something. Um, so on a normal Saturday night, we're going to be serving a la carte dinner upstairs, a la carte dinner on the porch, a special menu in the party room that seats 12, and then a whole different special menu for, you know, could be 80 people in the downstairs. And I think it was last Saturday where we had one of those times where time doesn't move or it, it, it moves, but you don't, you don't, you're not aware of time moving. Like it went so perfectly. We weren't even, they got to a point where we weren't even talking. We could hear the music from the wedding. So we were sort of dancing a little bit and the food was just going in and out. I had one of my sous chefs. He was with two other people plating the party. Brian, who's my chef and I are cooking on the line. And it was just absolute perfection. I mean, not going what? It doesn't happen every time like that. But when it does, you it's 5.30 and you're about to start and you literally blink and it's 10 o'clock. And you don't even know, it's like you don't even know what happened between that time. And it's, we were talking about it after that night. That's the rush that if you're into this business, that's what keeps you going those moments because it's such a great feeling. You would think you'd be exhausted, but when you have a night like that, you come off the line. You've just, and, and you're, you're tired, you're sweaty. Uh, you have to clean the whole kitchen. You clean the whole kitchen and you think by then you want to pass out and you know, fall to the ground. No, you feel, like you, you feel like you just woke up after a nap. So yeah, it's a, we call it, like I said, controlled chaos. It's a good But good it space. works. It always works. Nothing and works. and I, I know that, have all of you been to Bravo, Bravo, Bravo? Love that place. Do you know how big that kitchen is? Hmm? I, don't know how, I don't know how they do yeah. it. Yeah, it's tiny. See, the same thing. We always, like, we, in our old place, our kitchen was tiny. Our kitchen is tiny for the space we have now. But I think if your kitchen's too big, you get lost and it doesn't work as well. I think the smaller the kitchen, Bravo Bravo is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. The smaller the kitchen, the more efficient it works because there's no room to get lost. Everything is literally right in front of you or right to your left or right because there is nothing else. There's only this tight space. And you can be, you'll be amazed what people can do out of the tiniest little kitchens. 
Yeah. I, I'm always the other way around. Like when I go into a place and I see a tiny kitchen, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. If I go into a place and I see a huge kitchen, I, I think to myself, something's wrong. Like, that's not right. I mean, it's like this cavernous place. Like, they can't be doing much. And, and you turn the stoves on in the morning. Yeah, and they don't. And you don't turn them off. No, they're always. They go, especially this time of year, they're constantly. We have to actually write a schedule for our equipment. So like we write a schedule, this isn't too boring, is it? No. So we write a schedule for our equipment, right? So uh, we have to write a schedule, for, like Brian, he writes a schedule for our cooks. You have to be in here at this time, you know, and then you get a sheet of what you need to do and when you need to do it. We also write a schedule for the ovens because we have six ovens and we have X amount of stuff to do. So we have to have the schedule of what goes in the oven, what time, what goes on the stove top at what time. And that's a constant. And you don't want to, you miss by 10 minutes and it throws everything off. So you have to be on your game all day long, especially like I said, this time of year. Tell, tell us. Menu, right? hmm? What's that? That's attached to the menu. I mean, that's based on. That's based on the menu or, and then what the parties we have going on and yeah, what function. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a juggling. Yeah, I think that's what people don't realize. Like, name another business that you go to frequently, bank, post office, uh, I don't know, grocery store, whatever, that has that many balls in the air at one time. You're sitting at a table with two of you, you know, your, your spouse or whatever, and a couple friends, and you've all ordered four different appetizers, four different entrees, and you look around, the place is full, so did everyone else, basically, and yet it all comes up at the same time, and then there's the party in the other room. They got fed 80 meals all at once. It's juggling. Uh, to yeah. me, I still don't understand how it works. Um, you know, have, have any of you been in a kitchen when it's busy? You have? Which one? In Europe. In Europe? Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. It's pretty amazing. In Europe, they don't talk, though. We talk. Play music. Oh, yeah. Dance. <laughs> talk, talk a little, just a little, about the harassment stuff that's going on in restaurants. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> I just, read a, I just read an article. I, I was surprised about uh, Mario. He's the one I was most surprised about. I was also surprised, I don't even want to admit it anymore, but the one from New Orleans, John Besh, was my classmate. We oh, went to I culinary. Didn't know that. Yeah, we went to culinary together, and that started the whole thing. I, I, I didn't know about Mario. I've met Mario many times. Uh, his wife talked to Courtney about her book. Um, he seemed like a really nice guy. And he's adorable. Yeah. But, yes, he really I mean, is. Yeah, and I just read an article that Italy, well, we just had Lydia Bastianich on the radio show, and I think the way, and again, she's so nice, she wouldn't oh, say anything, yeah. you know, bad, um, but it sounded to me like they're taking over. Because her son, right, Joe Bastianich, Joe Bastianich. Is, is Mario Batali's partner. So it sounds to me, it feels like to me, especially when I read the article that they're taking over Italy, right? That's their, what is it? Uh, but they say that station, Joe, basically. the partner, yeah. was not blameless, blameless yeah. either. Yeah. And, what about, and what about when you look on television and you see, what is it, Gordon Ramsay? I mean, he has a filthy mouth and he's very nasty to everybody. I will tell you a story about Gordon Ramsay. Now, I will tell you, wait, listen, this is the funniest part about television. You have two chefs on television, uh, Tom Colicchio, who does Top Chef, and Gordon Ramsay, who does Kitchen Nightmares, or which, you know, he does a couple yeah. of them now. And here you go, you have uh, Gordon Ramsay, who on television is this horrible guy who screams and da da, but in real life is the nicest guy you'll ever meet. <laughs> And you have Tom Colicchio, who plays this nice guy on TV, and I'll leave that to your imagination, but it's, a, it's roles they play, right? Uh, uh, Gordon Ramsay figured it out in England that if he went in and had a mental breakdown in these restaurants that he was trying to help, it was good TV. Don't blame him. It's really good TV. <laughs> it is. But he's a super, super nice guy. He does have high standards, but he doesn't talk. Uh, just think about this way. If he talked to his employees that way, would they work for him? No. No. So this, no, this is, a, again, and he's, like I said, talk to anyone that's ever worked for him. He is one of the nicest people in the world. It's just on television he plays a raving lunatic. 
<laughs> it does. Uh, yeah. Now, um, just because not everybody knows about your background, yeah. but I do, were your parents unhappy when you decided to be a chef? I don't know. They never talked about it. So I went to school for engineering. And I did that for three and a half years. And right before graduation, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. So I ditched. No, I just couldn't do it. Electrical engineering. I took a job. We did the parking lots at um, West Farms Mall, the lights, because they were expanding the parking lot back then. Let me tell you how much fun that was. I couldn't see doing it. And I got into a car accident that's the summer before my Got into a car accident the summer before my senior year. Yes, the summer before my Were senior year. Were you driving? Year. Yeah, of course. You said I was a bad driver. That's how this, uh, that's how this story started. <laughs> they remember. So anyway, I got into a car wreck, and I, I was a college student, and I needed a car. My brother was already a chef somewhere. He had gone through culinary school. He was a chef on Lake Waramog in Connecticut. And what do you do when you're a college kid and you need money? Right? You work in a restaurant because that's the quickest way to make a lot of money. So I got a job as, um, I'm trying to think what I did. I ran the buffet, the food out to the buffet on, on Saturday night and Sunday morning. I don't know. And back then I made a hundred bucks in my pocket cash for just kitchen to dining room. And I had so much fun doing it. It was like recess to me. I was like, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. Anyway, so uh, fast forward, you know, so I did it. And then I came home on weekends because I was like, you know what, it's good to have some pocket money. So I came on weekends and I, I kept working there. And then one Sunday, the guy who was on the omelet station, we call it a no call, no show. So he basically just MIA went out. And he was with us the night before. Because remember, we did Saturday night and Sunday morning. So after you got out of work, the Marbledale Pub was right down the street. So the omelet guy was there with us. It just something happened between, I don't know, 3 AM and 8 AM, and he disappeared. <laughs> so my brother looks at me, and I'm sort of you know, dragging my heels and you know, lighting the sterno underneath the, the, the chafing dishes, getting ready to bring out the food for the Sunday brunch. And he looks at me and goes, you can make omelets. And I'm like, yeah, what's that has to do with anything? And he grabs me, puts a chef coat and a hat on me and st st sticks me in front of two burners and that was it. Yeah. But what was your father? Now, my father's a pastry chef. Yeah. It's funny because my father had a pastry shop in New York. He was the pastry chef at the Essex House when it became a Marriott Hotel in the 60s. And it's a Marriott Hotel again, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 so the son now runs the company, but he bought it because it was his... Wow, it was his grandfather, right? Yeah, it was his grandfather's first hotel. The, the Essex House, so they owned a bunch of motels going down 95 from Washington, then they went south, then they went north. I remember right? those. Yeah, yeah, they were little like park, it, they, it was revolutionary back in the day. You could park in front of your room, yeah. right? And he had a bunch of them, Marriott, that's how it started. And then he got, he made money and he started getting, you know, like, wow, this is really working. I'm going to be a hotel guy. And so they needed a flagship. So he went to New York and he bought the, Mar the Essex House. And then it was in, all through the 70s and into the 80s, it was the Marriott Essex House. And then it got sold when they moved to the Marquee on, in Times Square. But he... Uh, and what did your mother do? Wait, wait. He went on and taught at Culinary Institute when he were kind of retired and he was there for 30 years. So he had multiple. And my mom was a restaurant manager in New York too. So we were all, I mean, and my your brother. Two brothers? Yeah, my brother's, my brother's now, he's, he used to be a chef, but now he's in management and, uh, and he went to work for Marriott. He's at a JW Ritz Carlton in Orlando. And my younger brother's a pastry chef in Las Vegas. So the whole family. So we're the whole family's in it. So yeah, that's why I say it's a lifestyle, and it's a lifestyle I knew because I grew up in the lifestyle. So what does that mean? That means you know uh, Christmas is the, the weekend after, and uh, you know Thanksgiving's that weekend, and you know it's all the shifts you have to do. But the funny part is it doesn't change a thing. You're still with your family. You're still getting present. You're still doing all the normal things. You just do it like what we say on off hours, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's but it's, you know, people, I've been writing about food since the 70s, yeah. mid 70s, late 70s. And people have said to me, well, you know, why don't you think about opening a restaurant? Um, I'm too smart yeah. to do that. Yeah. It is an absolute passion. Yeah. I love to yeah. eat. I love to cook. I like to think about food. But as a lifestyle, 
Yeah. Every day I know that goes on, I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I just a hundred percent. Just the other day, we had Lydia Bastianich on our show. She wrote a book, right? Have you read her book? If you haven't read her book, you have to read her book. Her new one. Yes, it's a memoir. a memoir. It's about her family, though. It's about her, but it's mostly about her family. And I knew nothing. I mean, I've met Lydia before. She's been on the show many times. Her and Faith go way back. Um, but I only knew her from after the late '80s. She opened a restaurant in Manhattan and boom. I, well, it wasn't. So this is the funniest part. This is where, wow, I knew I was supposed to do this. So we're talking off the air and we're talking and she's like, you have a funny accent kind of thing, you know, and I'm like, no, I'm, I've never, no one's ever said that. She's like, where are you from? And I said, oh, I grew up in Forest Hills. And she goes, I lived in Forest Hills. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, my first restaurant was in Forest Hills. And she gives me the address and I'm like, that's three blocks from where I grew up. I walked by her restaurant. It was a little hole in the wall Italian place in Forest Hills. Her and her husband opened it up in the 70s before Lydia's. And it's just like all these things, you know, that kind of piece together. Um, and she lives in Jamaica Plain? Yeah, yeah, she just, I mean, she yeah. grew up, she, she stayed in, yeah, Jamaica Plains is the next town over from Forest Hills. And I, I had a chance to go and watch her do three of the episodes at her house. She's amazing. And they did two in the morning, then she made us lunch. Yep. She went into the kitchen and made lunch for seven or 15 of us, yep. I don't know how many. And then they were supposed to start with the second that afternoon, yep. and her daughter, who lives like next door, yep. came down with a granddaughter, and Lydia said, nope, we need to take half an hour, I gotta yep. go play with my grandson. He's, she's, she's a the, wonderful, yeah, wonderful yeah, person. She's the best. So read her, read her book. It's really cool. And I just have a thought, um, and I wonder what your opinion is. There's no other industry where you pay after. You know, you go to a show, you pay ahead. Amen. You pay, you pay ahead. You buy clothes, you buy Amen. Them, you Amen. So you're uh -huh. constantly being reviewed. Yep. Every single meal. Yep. It must affect our mentality. <laughs> Yeah, so think about, so everyone's like, oh, you're a chef at a fine dining restaurant or a casual fine dining restaurant. You must hate fast food. No, I love, fa I don't love the food. I love the concept. You pay, but you don't, you, do they hand you the bag? No, no, no sorry, pay first, then you get the bag. <laughs> yep, pay first, <laughs> otherwise you don't get the food. <laughs> Except for sometimes. Yeah, but I mean, it's amazing that, yeah, we're the last place left on earth that the guy building your house, he's not finishing it to you. Well, I'll finish, but I need the next check, right? Everything is pay to play. The restaurant business is the last place that you pay after. A little crazy, right? Yeah, any questions that you have, just- Yeah, shoot them up. Got it. What's my favorite restaurant? It changes all the time right now. There's a place, I live in Winstead, Connecticut. There's a place, I um, always have trouble with the pronunciation. Um, we'll get back to that one. Um, the other one is uh, Arethusa. Good story. I've never so been there. I was, I, was, uh, I was 15 years old, 16 years old. Yeah, 16 years old. We just moved to Connecticut because my father retired, and then he went to work in, uh, at Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, so we moved to Goshen, Connecticut. And I was in school, and I didn't know what I wanted to be, you know, do for a living, you know, when I grew up, whatever. So I needed a part-time job to see, and there was an antique shop right down the street called Lindsley Antiques. And so I get a job as an apprentice, cabinet-making apprentice. So I was like, maybe I'll do this, it sounds fun. So I worked for this guy for, Years. He ends up even being the best man in our wedding. I mean, amazing people. Um, so while we're doing this, they always had, they were, Don and Joe were, Don Lindsley was the number one male model in New York City in the 50s and 60s. And his partner, Joe Santura, was like the top photographer in New York. And they were a couple. And they had a house in Litchfield. So every weekend, they had friends come up and people come up. And one of the weekends, one of the couples that came up were these guys, and they had just gone to Italy, and they found this shoe. And I just remember being a kid, hanging out there, 16, 17 years old. You know, I'd mow the lawn for them, you know, just for extra pocket money as a kid. And they found these new shoes in Italy, and they're called 
Milano Blonix. Milano, 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 yeah. Milano. I'm a guy. Don't, yeah, whatever. They're shoes. So anyway, fast forward. Yeah, I've known them. So now they, uh, right? So now the shoes are doing great. They opened a, a restaurant in Litchfield, in Bantam, Connecticut. They also have a dairy. They have an ice cream shop in New Haven. I didn't know they own that. Yeah, Arethusa is their restaurant and their farm. Uh, Arethusa La Tavola is the restaurant. If you're ever in Bantam, it's an amazing place to eat. It's like being transported into the countryside in Italy. Yeah, and they're the greatest people. So nice. So you like that? I love that place. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, but it changes, right? Don't then you you like go to a place you like it and then you change and you like another one. Chinese food. Oh. Taste of China. Yeah, taste of oh. China. Yeah. Clinton it's really or New good. Haven. New Haven's a little fancier, but I'll I'll get down the on that. The food is really yeah. really good. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. What else? Yes. Spanish? I'm trying to think. Spanish. Oh well, no, Cassius. Oh, Casey's cheese. Did you ever yeah, go to Casey's in New London? And yeah, and forget about anything. Just have a grilled cheese and tomato soup and dip. You can dip. They allow you to dip it. No, in. you know what else they have there? Poutine. Oh, yeah. French fries with gravy and cheese curds. Oh. You can just take it and you put yeah. it right into your vein yep. and get a heart attack. Yeah. We used to go there more often. It used to be around the corner. Our, the studio from the Faith Middleton show used to be on Audubon, which is literally around the corner from Casey's. Now we're at Gateway Community College, so we're on the other, well, not that far, but yeah, we don't go as often anymore. But ooh, that was so good. Ooh, it, was, it still is good. Yeah. It is good. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay. We had um, we had lunch at Notre Dame on Monday, Ooh. and we had there's some more for dessert. Yeah. What? What are they? Okay. So you ready for this? So you ready? For, so this She's is talking a about a dessert. Shh. So this is a secret you can't tell anyone. So turn off the camera. No, uh, exactly. So so my dad retired from teaching at CIA. He's 81 years old, and he's home bored out of his mind <laughs> you know he's splitting wood doing things and a year ago I had this girl come in her name is Sierra she's I don't know 20 years old 21 years old whatever she's a kid in my eyes and she has a little bit of experience not much you know but we needed some help it was good you know she worked in a couple of restaurants and I was like this is cool and, you know, but I remember in the interview, she goes, I really like pastries. I'm like, okay, cool, you can do some pastries. So she works with, you know, doing some of the desserts, and she does pantry, and she's, like, working around. And so fast forward, my dad retires, bored. Sierra's, like, you can tell she's getting a little itchy. You know, maybe she's going to leave. It's, you know, she, we don't have that much upward mobility because no one ever leaves my restaurant when they work for me. Brian, my chef's been there 12 years. David, my one of my waiters, has been there 19. Brian's been there 18 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my staff never leaves. So anyway, we're like, what are we going to do with Sierra? You know, she's got this talent for dessert. She makes great desserts. But she didn't go to school. She doesn't, you know. So I'm like, I know. We'll have dad come in every Monday. I'll introduce him. And he will, instead of, because she doesn't have the money to go to school. Culinary school is so expensive now. It's like going to Yale. It is. Except when you get out, you make $15 an hour. So that makes no sense whatsoever. At least when you get out of Yale, you make money. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know what? Let's see how it goes. This is now... It's been now eight weeks, so two months, and he's designing a program specifically for her. Every week it's a new lesson. She has tests. She has to email uh, photos of all her work. He reviews it and grades her. And basically in two years, she'll have, she'll probably be one of the best pastry chefs in the state. I mean, that's after eight weeks. So, and that is not one of his. So she, she, he teaches her things, and then he, she has to follow his stuff and make his stuff. But as part of the projects, or homework, as he calls it, she has to do her own things, too. Because well, what was the dessert? It's a s'more. So she took graham cracker. So she's like, can you buy me uh, sheet pan um, extenders? I'm like, dumb chef here. You've been working with my dad for eight weeks now. You know what dad thinks of chefs. Yeah, don't worry. It's good that you're ma you, This is what he's talking to her in the corner of the kitchen. We hear her. It's good that you're doing this because, you know, now you can do desserts that aren't so easy 
even chefs can make them. Because he did the, my father did the pastry menu, the dessert menu for us. So he gave us recipes that, Christy, you're gonna love these desserts, they're great. They're so easy, even people like you can make it. I'm like, what do you mean people like me? Cooks. <laughs> So anyway, so she, so she, the sheet pan extended, so we have these cookie sheets, right? They're called half sheet pans. And you can buy these things that fit in them that make them go up, right? They're like walls. So she takes a layer of graham cracker, bakes in with butter, bakes that off, right? Sets it. And then the next layer is chocolate ganache, which is... Yeah, chocolate ganache, that's the next layer. The, ne the next layer after that, I call pudding, she calls pot de creme, because she works for dad now. <laughs> but pot de creme, you know, so just a, a custard. The next layer's custard, and then uh, she makes her own marshmallow. And she puts the teeniest hint of smoke in it with smoked sea salt, the teeniest. And then she flames it the top, she cuts squares out of it, and she flames the top like a toasted marshmallow, but it has the smokiness because of the smoked sea salt. And you had that? Like a campfire. campfire. Was it What'd great? Evil, right? So that's her first, is that her first? That's her first, that's her first dessert on her own. She is so talented, so, so talented. And I'm telling you, when she's done, I guarantee you, you'll see her name, no, she'll be gone. No, she'll be definitely gone because she's going to be one of the top pastry chefs in the country. Think about it. She has a pastry chef, uh, someone who was the pastry, the top pastry chef instructor at Culinary Institute of America for 35 years as her personal instructor. Wow. And that, so after eight weeks, that's her first dessert. Right? Yeah, yeah, just by, right, yeah. So it's on the menu now, so that's, it made the menu. So yeah, you were, you, it was probably a couple weeks ago she started with it, and uh, she had to modify it, and, he, and he, again, and he critiqued her, and he's like this and this, and let me tell you, this was not easy for him, because the French, they don't like marshmallow. Oh no. I didn't know that. Oh, they hate marshmallow, that's one of ours. Yeah, and my dad is not the new French. It's a totally different marshmallow. She made her, yeah, she makes her own marshmallow. Yeah. Yeah, because he's because yeah because my dad's like if you're gonna use marshmallow you better not buy them because she was gonna take little marshmallows and like stack them on top and then flame them and he's like no you're not if you're gonna do your own mar if you're gonna do marshmallow you have to make your own marshmallow it's uh, actually it's it's nothing more than uh, uh, the confectionery sugar gelatin and uh, something else cornstarch yeah cornstarch yeah I mean it's not. Corn syrup, corn syrup. It's not rocket science. And I watched her make it, and I'm like, oh. Getting them out of the pan is very difficult, though, because they get sticky. Yeah, yeah, but she puts it on, she pours it on top, right? And then it becomes the top layer on this thing. It's about what, about that high? Mm -hmm. And then she cuts it into squares, and then she flames it, right? Yeah. You should try her opera tort. That was him. Well, that so he, la yesterday we had opera tort on the menu, and I was like, yeah, we, they made they made it. They had their lesson, they made it, and I was like, okay, you can, yeah, do it as a verbal special. It didn't make the night. It was gone in the first hour. Describe to me. I had heard that as a a, a cookie, but I never heard of an. Do they pronounce opera it opera? Tart? Yeah, it's Viennese. Do they? So Viennese? that's from my mother's side. It's Viennese. It's one of the nice, most. It's one that and the soccer tart are the Ooh, two most. That I know. Yeah. What? Yeah, those are the two, right, non-French desserts that my father will acknowledge as desserts because they're not Parisian. But the opera tort is, uh, it's just, it's very simple. It's sponge cake. Um, it's sponge cake and then ganache and then uh, mocha buttercream, uh, marzipan. And then you layer it and you keep layering it up and layering it up and then you pour, pour, and then you pour ganache over the top and you write opera on the top. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Oh, and you soak the, because the, the French, they got to have booze in everything. Mm -hmm. Not that we have drinking problems as French people, no, because you never see us drinking it because we're eating it. So they take, a, they take a brush and they, get, they go up to the bar, they get the Kahlua and the sponge cake gets, not dabbed, drenched in Kahlua. So you leave happy. <laughs> it's an, when, it's an when, adult beverage dessert. When I moved from my big house in Old Lyme to my condo in Groton, I, people helped me do the kitchen. And I had, I think, 14 cases 
of booze. <laughs> and I don't drink. Yeah, she doesn't but drink But I at all. cook with it yeah. and I bake with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I do. Definitely. Oh, yes. The French love baking with alcohol. All right, any other question? Go ahead. What do you enjoy preparing as a dish? Hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. With relish. My own relish. I like making relish. Which hot dog place? Ooh. That's Frankie's. hard around I don't, here. I don't know. We won't even talk about it. That starts wars. It does. People are very particular. I don't care. I like all hot dogs. I've never seen a, I've, I've never passed. I grew up in New York. We ate the dirty water dogs. They were Those are wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. Nathan's. Nathan's, yeah. Nathan's are good. But we've got hot dogs here. We got Groton Weagle in Bloomfield, mm -hmm. uh, Mucky's in Hartford. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are made here, and down in New Haven is Hummel's. The Red Hots from Hummel's. Ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. All right. So, how often do you change your menu? Our menu changes. Well, there we have things because we've been around 20 years. We have things we can't take off the menu because they'd shoot us. Um, so now. Those are the only things that don't change because even if we come up with something they love and they say it has to stay on the menu, we say no because then you, you, the menu can only be so big. I got to change something. So everything else changes depend, depending on what we have. Like asparagus is on everything the last three weeks. Morel, yeah, morel mushrooms are on everything tonight because my forager brought like pounds of morel mushrooms and they're gone, right? This is it. They'll be here for this week and then they're gone. The asparagus has been on every uh, almost on every dish but next week they're gone right there won't be any more asparagus coming on the farms and we don't use it when it's not around we'll move on to the next thing like baby bok choy is coming so yeah it changes depending on i buy from two local farms one is holcomb farm because it makes me feel good yeah. because holcomb farm is a not-for-profit that um uh feeds the hungry in hartford so we pay for food and CSAs pay for food, CSA members pay for food, and that money goes to do CSA bags for people who have no food in downtown Hartford. So it's a really good feel good and the food is great. So that's one of my farms. And then for more specialty stuff, I use Young's Farm in Granby because I love them. Uh, Young's Farm was a land grant from the King of England in 1642 and so pre united pre every pre i mean there must have been nothing there and uh mr young's relatives which were the seymours um they came to the united states or connecticut back then this is before granby was formed before simsbury was formed to harvest pitch pine and then somehow some way they would get it to the connecticut river and the english would send ships up the connecticut river to pick up the pitch pine, then it would go back down to the harbor to repair the ships to go back to England. And it, it, he's got one of the original pieces, and his nephew has one of the original pieces. He's in Granby, the nephew's in Suffield. At one point, that was all one property. And there's a town Can you imagine? Is, is yeah, that's them. Sure, that's them. Yeah, that's not. Is that where the corn flour That's where the comes corn from? flour. Yeah, so he's diversified. It used to be a dairy farm. Now dairy is crazy, so he now grows wheat and corn and has a mill. So he does all our flour. He does uh, wheat berry. Uh, he does our wheat berry. He does dried beans, um, and he does uh, the what's that? The corn for Rice? not sweet corn, but the corn for Rice? Uh, grinding. Cow corn? No, it's not cow corn. It's. Uh, oh. Flint corn. He grows flint corn. Oh. Thank you. Yes, he grows flint corn and a special kind of flint corn. He went down to North Carolina because apparently they do the best flint corn and got the corn from there and brought it up here. And now he grows flint corn and he grinds it into corn flour, uh, polenta or grits, depending on the grind. Um, and he also grinds, he grows three different kinds of flour and grinds that. And the best part of that is, is that it's not how old the wheat is to make the flour, it's when it was ground. So we notice a difference right away when we switch to using his flours because we call him up and say, we need 10 pounds of flour or 50 pounds of flour. He mills it right there for us. And then we get the fresh flour. So it's that, so the dried wheat can stay, you know, for the year, but it's when you grind it and you use it right away, that makes the biggest difference. Wow. So yeah, it's a special farm. It's got a farm stand, look it up, Young's Farm in Granby. Yeah, Brussels sprouts are back. And everyone's like, you don't have Brussels sprouts on your menu. And I'm like, I do, just yeah. when they 
in the is fall. Is that why you don't like her as a cauliflower? No, I don't like cauliflower. cauliflower. But I love Brussels sprouts. I've always loved Brussels sprouts. Love now it's like on every menu. They're but where bad. are they? See, the cool thing about Brussels sprouts to me is that sweetness they have because you leave them on the stalk until three or four frosts go by. Mm -hmm. And yes. when they freeze, starch converts to sugar and they get sweet. Now people are just getting them from California. They're bitter, they throw sugar or, or reduced balsamic or honey in there. And, I mean, I like it, uh, but gosh, it's the new kale. It's on every menu as an appetizer for what? You pay a, for a little plate of Brussels sprouts, you pay like $12. Two more questions? Two more questions, then we gotta go. There's one. Blogs that you have time to read or like to read? Me? Oh, too many to even talk about. Food 52, I love. Yes. There's a new, Faith, or uh, Lee just talked about one that was on NPR last night, right? Yeah. It was amazing. That's funny because you wrote, you wrote that and I'm like, yeah, Did I was you see it? No, I was listening to it. It was great. My friend Phyllis and I went to see oh. Book Club last night. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's wonderful. Great movie. Yep. On the way home, I was in my car. Phyllis went to What's her house. I was Moth listening to NPR. No, 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 the Moth Radio Hour. The Moth Radio Hour. Yeah. And yeah. the one that I heard, I was laughing and crying yeah. all the way home. So you were coming, you were going home at the same time I was going home from work. Was I? Yes. Yeah, yeah because yes. we listened to it at the same time in the car. That was the funniest thing when you posted that this This morning. is a guy yeah. who has a farm and a restaurant yeah. on the vineyard. Yeah. And he talked about when the first time he decided he wanted to cook. Yeah. Now, then he was talking about the people that work for him. Yeah. He has his own farm. Yeah. So he farms and uses this. Yeah. And I immediately went on to Facebook yeah, to last night yeah. or this morning yeah. and said to anybody who sees me on Facebook, you go to the Moth Radio and this particular episode three. is called Three Chefs yeah. and a Meal. Yeah. So it's three different. I think, was he the first segment or the second segment? It was the first. He was the first segment. So there's three different people that talk about food. And I'm with, uh, if I almost crashed because I was laughing so hard. And, and <laughs> because I'm a bad driver. Too. It always comes back to me being a bad driver. <laughs> because it was in the vineyard and they found out guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah. But Obama. Yeah, and yeah, his because wife. Obama spent a lot of time and, on the menu. And just the 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 garde manger, yeah. which is the yeah. person who does salads mostly, yeah, an was was 19 years old, yeah. and her she is also from a farm, yeah. and she made this beautiful lettuce, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it oh. was just and and I was laughing and crying at the same yeah. time. Oh, they were talking Go about the, the secret service radio. in the kitchen. Secret service. service in the kitchen. Oh, it's just just listen to it. It's great. And the so secret service is taking pictures of all the food. And he thought and it was like he thought he thought it was like oh is this to document like if he gets sick or what it was? And he said, "No, I'm doing this because this is so cool." <laughs> That's not quite what he said. And I can't believe they put that on the radio. I know. <laughs> You'll I, hear know. Yes. I know. I know. Remember the book that you and I read from book club? It was about a young woman that went to New York to work. At oh, Sweet Bitter. Sweet Have any of you read it? Sweet Bitter? Oh, well, wow. it's on television yeah. now. Yep. It is written by a young woman, and it's it's not autobiographical, but it sort of is. And she actually Fiction. worked for um, the guy, the great. Um, the guy who owns all the restaurants and everybody. Oh, Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer. Yep. Um, and it was a it was a, a dirty, vulgar, funny book. <laughs> well, it's about and, the restaurant life. And it has the to be television dirty and is vulgar and dirty and what's, funny. What's it on? Huh? What's it on? It's is on it HBO. Or? Oh, HBO. Okay. Cool. HBO. Oh, it would have to be on HBO, wouldn't it? It would have to be on HBO. <laughs> Late night. <laughs> yeah. It start. It's. I just watched the third installment. Uh, wow. Yeah, you can get it. Go ahead. Yes, sweet bitter. But the book is wonderful. Should we have him again next year or the year before? Of course. Thank you, Thank and you. Lee. Thank you. Thank you.